Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name is Greg. I'm an alcoholic. And thank you, Tamara, for the invitation to attend the meeting today and participate in it. My wife is a fan of the Broken Elevator. I found out about the group through her. And I've attended a couple of your meetings. I'm usually working this time of day. But I very much appreciate the enthusiasm that the members of the meeting have and the way you conduct the meeting and the service that you all do. So thank you all for for doing that, keeping the meeting open. And uh, thanks for the people that I know that are attending as well. I know a few of you. It's good to see you. Uh, July 15th, 1992 is my sobriety date. I didn't know that was going to be my sobriety date. I did not decide to quit drinking that day. Uh, The night before, I hadn't been a terrible drunk. Four Miller Genuine Drafts, pretty wimpy bottom. But uh, I woke up on a Wednesday morning, and I didn't drink, and I didn't know why. And, And looking back on it, and I got through Thursday, and I didn't drink. And I woke up Friday morning, July 17th, 1992, and I knew I needed help. I knew something had to change, and I was out of ideas about how to try to fix it. And alcohol had beaten me to the point where I became willing to ask for help. Uh, I would wake up most mornings hungover, and I would look at myself in the mirror, and I wouldn't like the person I was looking back at, bloodshot eyes. And I'd become a person that uh, I'd never thought I'd be, the way I was living a double life, you know, keeping up a front that I was okay and that I was holding things together, but inside I'm falling apart. And pretty soon things on the outside are starting to slide away. Meaningful relationships with people are disappearing, primarily because of my drinking, but also because of, uh, I tend to be, prone towards resentment, fear, and guilt. And uh, that's a pretty uh, corrosive mixture when it comes to getting along with other people, particularly the resentment part of it. So uh, I would tell me that morning that, you know, I'm not going to drink today. And I would mean it. And I'd uh, go to work, do my best to try to get some work done. Usually the mornings weren't very good because I was headachy and slightly nauseous and just difficult to concentrate in that mode. And about noon, I'd start feeling better and maybe I'd have lunch and maybe I wouldn't. And then somewhere in the afternoon, the thought would come to mind, you know, the problem was the sixth drink last night. If you just stick to two, you'll be okay. And I'd think again, you know, that that's BS. I mean, how many times have I told myself that? But that thought would recur, and by 5, 5.30, I'm thinking, okay, I got time just for a couple of drinks. I'll stop at the bar on the way home, or I'll stop at the store on the way home, and I'll just have two, and then I'll go home. And I'd start in on the first drink, and I'd tell myself, I'm going to quit with the next one. And I'd get about halfway through that one, and I'd decide I had time for one more. And then I decide when I'm finished with that one, I got time for, you know, I can't quit on an odd number. I got time for one more and I won't be impaired. I can still get home. Okay. And I'll be all right. And then it's on. Then I don't know when it's going to stop. And I wake up the next morning hungover and swearing I'm not going to do it again. I do that for years. And the one constant is the drinking got worse. The consequences got worse. And, uh, I was unwilling to ask for help or admit that I had a problem other than maybe after a real bad drunk. But, uh, you know, I kept the job and I kept the cars in the garage and the garage over the cars and kept showing up for work and never got in trouble with the law. So some of the consequences that we run into that may compel us to do something just didn't happen until that Friday morning 
when uh, I knew I was drinking myself to death and I knew I couldn't quit. I became willing to ask for help. I knew about AA because of my dad. He had gotten sober in AA before I came along. And uh, he stayed sober for many years, but he did not stay active in the program recovery. And he was a very difficult man to be around. He was prone to rage. He was distant. Uh, I remember, you know, watching the level of the newspaper at night if he was home from work. You know, if the newspaper was up, it was safe. But if the newspaper started coming down, I tried to find a place to disappear. It's tough to do when you're an only child. But uh, that's kind of how it was with my dad. And so I swore I was never going to be like him. I was never going to become alcoholic. I was certainly never going to come to Alcoholics Anonymous. And in short, Alcoholics Anonymous is the best thing that ever happened to me. Last place I ever wanted to come. So what I have deduced from that is I really don't know what's good for me, if I'm honest. Because I was on my way to drinking myself to death and not wanting to ask for help until that Friday morning. So I called AA, and a man 12-stepped me, and he shared about his drinking and where it took him, and he had been a brown bag wino. He lived on the streets for a period of time, and I was still living in suburbia in a house that the bank and I owned. And so fortunately, I was uh, beat up enough to hear the similarities and not the differences. And that man took me to my first meeting that Friday night. And uh, I've been going to meetings ever since because I heard two things at that meeting that I believe are the music of Alcoholics Anonymous. One was laughter. Even before I got in the meeting room, there was laughter. It was a men's meeting on a Friday night at eight o'clock, well after Miller time. And these guys were laughing and they weren't drinking. And that got my attention because whenever I didn't drink, there was no laughter. I mean, it was tough. I was a white-knuckle, sober person if I wasn't under the influence of alcohol. These guys weren't like that, at least at 8 o'clock on that Friday night for an hour and a half. The second thing I heard was honesty, gut-level honesty. The man who led the meeting talked about where his alcoholism had taken him. He talked about pulling off a robbery to feed his ability to get his alcohol while his wife was delivering one of their children, how guilty he felt about that. And I thought, wow, maybe there's a way here where I can quit living this double life, where I can quit worrying about what you're going to find out about me, because I don't want you to know who I really am. And my nature is to keep secrets and to live a double life and then worry about what's going to happen if you find out. Thank God for Alcoholics Anonymous and 12 Steps. So that man who 12-stepped me suggested I go to a men's book study on Wednesday night. And this is where prime time came into my life. It's the White Flag Men's Group. Um, E just mentioned it. That was my home group for the first 28 years of my sobriety. It wasn't a prime time meeting per se, but I found myself in Bob A's chain of sponsorship. Bob A sponsored Ron D, who you heard from in May. I believe he was a speaker back in May. He sponsored a guy named Dave W., who sponsored me for the first 22 years of my time in India. And so I was raised with what has become to be known as the primetime message. I didn't know it anything different than Alcoholics Anonymous at the time. And I still believe that that's what it is, that uh, alcoholism is what I believe is a threefold problem. I have a physical allergy to alcohol. That's when I tell my why I, when I tell myself I'm just going to have two and I overshoot the mark. That's that physical thing happening. I I crave more alcohol. When I drink, I get thirstier when it comes to alcohol. And and that's the physical reaction that I have. And while that's happening, my brain changes. And I I change my behavior to accommodate my drinking because of that craving. And I can't beat that craving. I can't drink enough to stop it. I typically drink till I pass out. And that's because of that physical allergy. The second part of it is I have an obsession to enjoy and control my drinking. A mental obsession. And that's why, even though I have bad drunks, and I have romantic interests telling me, you know, I can't be around you if you're going to drink like this, I'm out of here. 
and I'm estranged from my family because of resentment or because of guilt about how I treat them or behave around them. Um, I still pick up the next drink because of the effect it produces. I get a sense of ease and comfort from that drink, like it talks about in the doctor's opinion. And that's where I was directed, and that's where I started to find out what was wrong with me. Mental obsession, physical allergy. Third part of it, I believe, is a deep spiritual unrest. Somewhere inside of me, I know life is supposed to be good and worthwhile. I just don't know how to produce it on my own. And that, I believe, is the essence of my unmanageable life. And while I'm still active in AA today, 31 years plus since my last drink, because I still have the mind of a chronic alcoholic. I tend to be self-centered. I didn't know that coming into AA, but it's certainly true. If I listen to what my brain is talking to me about, it's talking to me about me, what I like, what I don't like, what you think about me, like I'm a mind reader for crying out loud, how the world should be, how much money I should have, all kinds of stuff. And it's all self-centered. And a lot of it's fear-driven. My basic nature is to be fear-based. And that produces this sense of unease that I suffer from. And when I discovered alcohol, although I didn't realize it, I had found a treatment for alcoholism in the short run. Unfortunately, the consequences of uh, the way I drink eventually outstripped the ability to find comfort from my drinking. And after a long enough period of time, of increasing levels of fear around my drinking, I couldn't drink enough to get free from the anxiety that I suffer from. And that's when I hit bottom. And so my talk today really is about surrender, the key to a contented sobriety. Because without a surrender, I keep going to me for a solution to my problem. And I go to that same brain that's creating the problem by how I see the world and how I perceive it. So prime time really is about a methodology for orienting the AA member to what the real problem is prior to starting steps. And when the men at White Flag, in particular my sponsor, his sponsor, Bob, talked about the unmanageable life and waking up in the morning and already feeling like you're behind the eight ball, you know, that kind of thing. Man, I, I identified. And I saw my father. And I saw how he lived, and I saw his emotions up and down, and the anger and the fear. And I, I started to see that I have a bigger problem than just not drinking. And all of a sudden, I realized why I couldn't quit and stay quit, because I get uncomfortable when I don't drink. And without a solution, without a program recovery, what am I going to do? Well, eventually, I'm going to pick that drink up, find some relief, whether I want to or not. And I've had those strange mental blank spots prior to coming to AA. So all of a sudden, I started to see I have a problem that can kill me sober by either driving me back to drink or put me in a life that I can't stand living to the point where I want to check out. And that was kind of my plan prior to AA. My mother, my father had died before I got sober. My mother was in her 80s. And I thought, you know, I'm going to outlive her and then I'm checking out. This is just too hard. And thank God that plan didn't... Uh, come to pass because I'd have missed the best years of my life. My mom lived another 14 years and I am truly grateful for the steps of Alcoholics Anonymous because I was able to make amends with her. And when she passed, I knew that we didn't have any unfinished business and I knew she loved me and I loved her and there was nothing anybody could do to change that. And so uh, thank you, Alcoholics Anonymous. So, I found out what, what, what was wrong with me here, and I think more importantly in the long run, I found out what could be done about it. There's a program recovery here, a power and a method of living that will treat my alcoholism. But it's not a one and done, in my opinion. I don't just go through steps and I'm fixed, and I can uh, live on some shortened version of the principles that we have to practice here. My experience is if I stop taking steps, I may not drink, but I go right back to the unmanageable life. I go right back to being driven by fear, by becoming uncomfortable, by harming the people around me, by feeling guilty, and I'm back in a, in a trap I can't get out of. 
So the surrender, in my experience, has been ongoing. Initially, it was produced by alcohol. I was beaten into it. And then I was introduced to the writings of Harry Thibault, which has been extremely helpful. Initially, that was in A.A. Comes of Age. There's a transcript of a talk that he gave, and then there's a reprint of an article, Therapeutic Mechanisms of Alcoholics Anonymous. And he talks a lot about surrender. And I started to see that initially the surrender, the stopping of my ego forcing me forward, that broke. And at that point, I was able to get help. That's when I picked up the phone and called AA. That was my act of surrender, to ask him for help. That was followed up about three weeks later when I asked a sponsor to take me through the steps. And that was Dave. And the reason why I asked him for help was he talked about finding a power and a method of living that gave him an effect that was better than what he got out of the bottle. And that got my attention. He wasn't living with white knuckle sobriety. He had an effect. He had something that treated his alcoholism so that he could live a useful and content life. And I wanted to know more about that. And what he did, and this is what I think is so important about sponsorship, is he was able to show me how to apply the steps. He would share with me how he started his day. Bob used to say, if you don't start your day with a program of recovery, you don't have one. And I believe that's true because I'll start with me talking to me and I basically give me bad news and bad advice if if I look at the results I get. And so, gee, why am I surprised? You know, I'm self-centered and fear-based and I don't consider the implications of my actions to other people, not because I don't want to, it's because I can't. I'm selfish and self-centered. My brain does not think in compassionate, loving ways when I'm running scared. So I need a power. I need something other than me to help me. I was looking for it in the bottle because that would shut off that feeling of being anxious and apart. I'd be able to connect at least for a short period of time. But then I'd overshoot the mark. And now I'm doing antisocial things like driving drunk, putting your life and mine in danger without any real consideration for other people. That's my self-centeredness. And I'm still that way, absent of power greater than me in 12 steps. So the surrender now, as Thibaut says, comes down to adopting a disciplined way of life. The surrender, if I'm not beaten into it by circumstance, becomes an essential disciplinary function. What does that mean? That means steps in application. That means I start my day with the first step. I start my day with the admission that I'm powerless over alcohol, dash, separate thought, that my life's unmanageable today, sober, without help, that I cannot find a way to live a useful, contented life on my own individual strength and intelligence. And it doesn't matter how long I've been here, because my granddaughter will create an art project using silver glitter and the glitter ends up all around the house. I didn't know silver glitter was migratory, but it is. It doesn't stay put. It moves everywhere around the house. And my brain just explodes. You know, that shouldn't happen. She shouldn't be doing that. She's only six for crying out. And she was making like um, the first letter of our names. So I just have a bad brain. Is it possible there's a power greater than me that can solve my problem? Well, I see all of you sober, and there have been people sober here in AA since 1934, although AA was originally founded in 35, Bill Wilson got sober in December 34, and it's worked since then. And I can't deny the fact that it's the only thing that's ever kept me sober in my life. I cannot quit on my own, and I can't stay quit. So that first step is the admission that I need help today. It's a chronic condition. It comes back. It's not an acute condition that gets cured, but there's a treatment. And I came to believe in a power greater than me by listening to you all talk about how you came to believe and seeing what happened in your lives. So I met men at the Friday Night Stag, at White Flag, who've been through difficulties in life that I certainly would drink over, and they said they stayed sober. And that good things came of it. If no more than they were able to sit down with another alcoholic and share about these things in an effort to help someone else. 
and that all of a sudden they they experienced some healing from some of the things that had happened that they wished hadn't happened. And I've experienced that as I've gone through steps, writing an inventory and, and sharing my secrets. I find out that the person I'm sharing with shares something with me that's similar, and all of a sudden I'm not the only person that had done what I've done or drank the way I drank or lived the way I lived. And it starts to break down that feeling of being unique, that I'm the only one. Now I'm one of many. And I'm one of many who have a common goal of staying sober a day at a time. And now something can happen. Something remarkable can happen. So I've come to believe in a loving, powerful, present God. That isn't the God I grew up with. And I do my best to stay in contact with that power moment by moment. And my brain will take me on a trip. It'll start talking to me about tomorrow when I'm traveling to Wisconsin or last week when I should have done something like return an email that I forgot. So the effort in the third step, a big part of it for me in making the decision to turn my thinking and my actions over to the care of a power greater than me is to stay present in the moment. That when my brain takes me on a trip to get off the bus and get back to where I'm at, where are my feet? Where's my butt? What's right in front of me? What's God's will for me? What's right in front of me? To be here with you right now, to do my best to tell the truth, and to leave the results up to this power greater than us. And whatever's going to happen is going to happen. And I make that decision every morning. I recite the third step prayer. As part of my morning prayer before I even hit the head. And uh, the way I see it, those are the formal terms of surrender. The future is none of my business. My job is to stay present, to stay close to a power greater than me, perform that power's work well. The power will take care of me. And that's what's happened. Do I always live like that? No. I get running scared sometimes, go back to self, end up back in the life I can't stand living. But I don't have to stay there if I'm willing to promptly admit it to inventory. And this time of year, I typically write an inventory. I've just been writing one. And maybe this is 10 step. Maybe it's four step. I use the same format that I was given when I first went through the four step. And what inventory does is it shows me the things that are blocking me off from a power greater than me. Like I get running scared behind money. I'm looking at retiring pretty soon. And do I have enough? I'm going to outlive my money. Well, I don't know how much money is enough, but I know I haven't got it and I never will because money can't solve my problem. What can? Relying on a power greater than me to provide what I need when I need it. Because for the last 67 years, that's what's happened. My needs have been met a day at a time. Sometimes not because I earned a paycheck, because I was willing to ask for help or something unanticipated happened, a connection. Nothing that I created. So my job, the way I see it, is to stop worrying about me and to start to pay attention to you. What can I do to be useful? The way I've been sponsored, I've been told Alcoholics Anonymous isn't a self-help program, it's a self-abandonment program. But as an alcoholic, I'm too far gone for self-help. If I could have gotten self-helped, I'd have never gotten here. The fact is self-help doesn't work for a person like me because of self, because of the thing I'm trying to use self-help with, my power. But the power greater than me, that works. Inventory shows me what blocks me off, like making money my higher power, or making your approval my higher power, or making my wife's approval my higher power. I can't rely on that. What happens if my wife criticizes me? What happens if I do something she disagrees with? Does that mean I have to suffer? Well, only if I'm with self. And I've decided that she's my higher power without realizing it. So inventory will show me these things. And out of that comes the ability to admit the exact nature of my wrong. I put something in front of my relationship with my higher power. And I'm paying the price for it. Because that stuff can't solve my problem but the power can. And out of that comes a willingness to have God remove my defects. 
What are my defects? The things I'm doing that I shouldn't be doing. Like judgment. I just love to look at people and judge them without even knowing them. Judge events. If I could be free from judgment, I wouldn't have much to fight with people about. I wouldn't have much to disagree about. I could just be one of. Let you be you. I can be me. And maybe we can find some common ground. Look for similarities, not differences. That's been a big lesson here in the end. I do my best to clean up the amends I need to make. Humbly asking God to remove my shortcomings, the things I'm not doing that I should, which opens the door to doing something for you without a hook in it. And that's where I find peace. That's where I find enthusiasm for life. A lot of that has come through service in AA. I've always had a job in my home group. Right now, I'm our delegate to the central office, the uh, intergroup here in Sacramento. We have 293 registered groups and about 1,200 meetings a week. And the uh, delegate body oversees the central office. We provide literature to AA groups and a meeting schedule, including both face-to-face and online meetings. And then a communication hub for what's happening in the AA communities, conferences and picnics and what groups are doing. And it's been a real joy to be involved with that service. I've learned an awful lot about what our intergroup does and the people that do it. My sponsor kind of led me into it. He answers the phones and he shoots me 12-step calls, which I appreciate. That keeps me on the front lines of AA. And I'm repaying the debt to the man who was there for me. His name was Dean, took me to my first meeting. And uh, I've had the chance to do that for some people here in AA. And I always think of him and thank him for taking me to my first meeting, for being available to help somebody he'd never met at that moment of surrender. And uh, there's a lot of joy in that. It's the last thing I'd, last place I'd look, you know, doing something for someone that I'd never met before, not wanting anything from them, wanting something for them, hope they find a solution but just making the hand of AA available. One of the most difficult amends I've had to make was uh, where I used to work. I I like to tell this story because it's, you know, belief in a higher power is one thing. Reliance is another. And I can believe all day long and block God out of my life. Talks about it in the seventh step in the 12 and 12. It's like watching the... uh, tightrope walker push the wheelbarrow across the tightrope you know i'm sure he's going to make it across he's a professional he's trained he's done it a thousand times it's a different deal when you put your butt in the wheelbarrow and let him push you across the tightrope and that's where i go from belief yeah he can do it to reliance you better do it or i'm not making it and i've come at times to rely on this higher power so i worked at the same place for 32 years And I worked with one of uh, a person that I had known for a long time. He introduced me to the job opportunity. We'd worked together at a big government bureau prior. And uh, in a lot of ways, he was like my dad. And we were kind of drinking buddies for a period of time. I happened to get sober while I worked there. And uh, he never did. He never really figured out what his problem was. But it got to the point where uh, he couldn't control his temper and the work environment degraded to the point where I realized I couldn't stay there. And in inventorying this, I inventoried it for a long time, and I was trying to, for lack of a better term, rise above his anger and his self-centeredness and the the related stuff that was going on, the treatment of the staff, and having to come in and clean up the mess. And uh, I just couldn't do it, and I realized that uh, I had been dishonest with him and with my other coworkers because I'd never talked about my inability to work in the environment that had evolved. And when I finally got honest and admitted that, and basically I I, uh, went to him and said, you know, uh, this behavior continues. I'm going to have to leave because I can't work in this kind of an environment. And two years later, uh, the the behavior continued, and and I realized that I, I had to make good on that or I wasn't relying on a power greater than me. I was just doing the same thing I always do, avoid confrontation, to avoid people yelling at me and all the stuff I'd grown up with. And and, uh, 
That's dishonest by omission. And so in telling the truth and then relying on a power greater than me, what happened in short was an opportunity to move to another office in the same office complex with a group of people in the same line of work, but to work independently on my own opened up and doors opened where I didn't know there were doors. And I had no idea what was going to happen when I went in my co-worker's office and told them I, I have to go. But I realized that uh, that surrender opened up what's been the best seven years of my career. I love being a sole proprietor. I love being in the office with other people that are in a similar line of work. I have two part-time employees that I work with who are wonderful human beings. And the other people in the office are kind and considerate humans. And I'd have missed that if I would kept trying to use self-will to keep me at the same place just because I thought, you know, I want to retire here. So when I rely on a power greater than me, things can happen that I can't possibly produce because they're not in my conception of my life. And that feeds back to the second step where I start to believe that God's will for me is better than what I can produce. And the enthusiasm and the open mind and wanting more of that starts to come into my life. You know, enthusiasm is something that self steals from me. Because my brain goes to drudgery. You know, I got to do another day of this. But boy, I'm missing that moment when I can interact with one of my grandkids. We've got twins, Hank and Maggie. They're both six. Like last night, they stay overnight a couple nights a week. I sat down with Hank and we read a, a book about cars. He's a car nut. And he loves the little matchbox cars. He's got hundreds of them. And uh, he loves to sit and read before he goes to bed. Last night, we were reading about the 100 most interesting cars that have been produced. And, and you know, I miss that when I'm with me because, you know, I don't want to be bothered. I have better things to do. Well, no, I don't. Not in God's world. I'm supposed to be here for the people close to me. I'm supposed to be a giver, not a taker. I'm supposed to be connecting with all of you. I can't live by myself in my world. That's the world where I'm run by fear, disconnected, and eventually desperate without realizing. I want to talk a little bit about traditions um, in two, two ways. One, I'm a very strong believer in the necessity of observing our traditions in AA, singleness of purpose. The third tradition, the only requirement for membership is a desire to stop drinking, self-support not aligning with other organizations, sticking to what we do and how we do it, avoiding controversy. There was an example. A friend of mine used to be the uh, central office manager here, and there was a another recovery program that criticized AA and got into the media here in this area. The media contacted my friend in his role as the office manager, and he said, we have no opinion on it. And that was the perfect 10th tradition answer to what could have gotten us into a public controversy based on being criticized by another organization. But we didn't take the bait. And that's the beauty of traditions. It avoids problems that we might otherwise fall into. And my wife and I, before we got married, I met my wife here in AA. Um, we got to know each other before we got involved. That was new territory, right, for both of us. And before we got married, we courted for just short of four years. And uh, we met with a, a minister who was very helpful. And we also listened to people in AA who were married for a long time or in sober for a long time and married to each other for a long time. You know, not serial marriages, but like one marriage to each other. And they talked about how they applied the traditions in their in their marriage, in their relationships. And that really got our attention. And so we went through the uh, traditions checklist from the grapevine. It's a series of questions behind each tradition. And we asked ourselves those questions in terms of our marriage, you know, like the unity of the marriage coming first. 
like the necessity for a group conscience. I can't make decisions that may impact my wife without talking with her about it. Family decisions, right? When the kids and the grandkids are involved. The unity of the family, considering that and the importance of it. Families can be very fragile, particularly uh, my wife's son, my stepson, he's a sober member of the program. His wife, the grandkids' mom is sober again. She's had her difficulties. But I've seen the dynamic of untreated alcoholism and the destructiveness from childhood through to the current time. And the importance of spiritual principles and the application of those principles. So my wife and I wrote out a marriage agreement. And thank God we've lived up to it. We've been married 23 and a half years. I'd never been married before because I couldn't keep a relationship together. I'm too self-centered and too frightened. And she'd been married twice. And so um, the principles work. The principles work. My job is to acknowledge that I don't know how to do this, ask for help, (coughs) excuse me, and then follow through, take the action. And so is our marriage perfect? No, we have our difficulties, but we have a set of principles that we can rely on and a trust in a higher power that gives us the courage to talk about the things that are difficult. I have to take steps in my own life to be in the position of having some clarity on what the problem is. It's not what she's doing. It's the demands I place on her and being freed from that by a power greater than me so that I can go to her with an open mind and an open heart and ask, you know, how can we work through this? And we're going to be doing a lot of this in the coming months because I'm going to be retiring And everything's going to change in terms of income. And I've been fortunate to have a a good career and being able to save. In spite of what my head tells me, we'll be okay. Because there's an abundant power that will take care of us. I may not get to spend everything I want to spend how I want to spend it. But, you know, that's probably good. Some discipline in my life is a good thing. And uh, we'll be okay but we'll have to go through a process of getting there and there'll be some mistakes and there'll be some making amends and moving forward. And that's beautiful because uh, I've come to believe that it isn't where we end up. It's not the destination. It's the journey. It's today, today's journey. This is the day when I can practice what I believe God would have me do and do it. Like show up for work, give my clients my best effort, follow through on the things I told them I was going to do, or if I can't, let them know that, and then make amends as quickly as I can. Stay active in Alcoholics Anonymous, show up for my commitments, or if I can't, let people know. To help where I can help and get out of the way where I can't, and to do my best to stay in contact with a power greater than me, so I don't slip back into trying to run the show on my terms. So I mentioned my sponsor answers the phones at central office <clears throat> on Mondays. And uh, I signed up to be on the 12-step list. And lately, I've had the chance to uh, talk to some wet drunks. And uh, one guy in particular comes to mind. I'm sponsoring him. We're going through steps together. He's basically housebound. And he has health problems beyond alcoholism, some of them related to his alcoholism. But the beautiful thing that I see in him is he's willing. He's doing the reading I ask him to read. And not just reading it to say I've done it, but giving some thought to it, recognizing the identification. And although he's not able to connect very well with the fellowship. He's making an effort to get to meetings, but he has to depend on transit, uh, public transit that's available for people with disabilities here in the area. And that can be difficult to do. And it takes time, but he's making the effort. He's writing an inventory, even though he has problems writing because of neuropathy and he has a related health issue that makes it difficult. But, you know, I see in him the willingness and the spark 
and he's coming to believe, and I can see change happening in his life. And that reinforces my belief that this power and 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous aren't hit or miss. But if I'm willing to let go of my ideas, rely on a power greater than me by doing what I think that power would have me do, I'll stay sober and I'll find myself in a useful and contented life. But it's an ongoing surrender because I got an ego that keeps coming back. Thank God for the 10th step, right? It's not if I'm wrong, it's when I'm wrong. Promptly admit it and do what? Inventory me, go through steps four through nine, make amends, and then get back to seeing who I can help. And I will, when I live like that, life is good. I'm blessed to be uh, in a home group that's active and we get new members in and we meet both face-to-face and uh, online. At the same time, we have a hybrid meeting. And I believe that's important going forward because one of the lessons that I took from the pandemic and Broken Elevator's evidence of it is that a lot of people have grown up in the digital age and they're used to connecting digitally and getting information and social interaction digitally. We need to be available digitally to reach the alcoholic that still suffers. And that's our real job as a fellowship. It was explained to me early on, there's a difference between the fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous and the 12 steps, the program of recovery. The fellowship is a powerful thing. This is the way we meet and extend the hand of aid to the people that need help. You know, there's a central office. And when I hit bottom, I called the phone number and, you know, yelled for help. And there was people that were willing to step out and help. Well, now we can do that digitally. At the beginning of the uh, pandemic we pivoted away from face to face and basically the fellowship in our area was all online for a period of time and i started sponsoring a guy that march and the first year we basically met online and interacted online took steps online and he stayed sober and so that showed me that the power greater than us can communicate with us in a variety of ways I still think the face-to-face is important, particularly things like the fifth step. But if that can't be done, we can still connect. And the younger generations that have grown up in the mobile age, in the digital age, how are they going to find us if we're not available digitally? So I'm glad that we're still present and that we're still doing outreach through this medium. Because I hope AA is here if my grandkids ever needed, or if your grandkids ever needed. And so I hope our minds are open to new ways to extend the hand of AA. I want to thank you all for the opportunity to be here and to to share. Uh, Alcoholics Anonymous has saved my life. And, uh, you know, I found out what was wrong with me here. I found out alcoholism was a disease that it isn't caused by drinking, but that I use drinking to treat it, but that there's another treatment, that there's a power greater than me, and you gave me the open door to have a relationship with that power. You told me my mind was open, and I was willing to ask this power to reveal itself to me in a way I could understand it would, and that I could connect with this power and rely on it, and that's what's happened. Some days I don't see it, and I don't feel it, but you know, I've stayed sober since doing my best to practice these principles. And I find myself in a life that I don't want to trade, even though sometimes it's tough. Still, we can get through it. And there's a tremendous amount of joy in it. Things have happened that there's no way I could have produced. So uh, I'm going to end a little bit early. Thank you all very much for listening and God bless. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.